Amen. Okay, so uh, we are going to talk today about God's promises. And this is kind of a unique message. It's not part of a series. We start the new series next week. Um, but this is a message that I felt convicted to bring to you because we were in the middle of the Life of Joseph series and we were talking a lot about the will of God. Were you guys there the week we talked about the will of God? We're talking about the will of God and how sometimes we're trying to interpret the will of God in our life. And I remember being inside of one of those messages and just thinking, you know, if I had more time, which is pastors think about this a lot, by the way, if I only had more time to preach, um, I would tell you a lot about the promises of God because a lot of times when, when we're in those difficult, maybe even confusing times of our lives, it's the promises of God that are the fixed points in the universe for us. It's the promises that we need to hold on to. And so I'm going to tell you a story about Jacob. Because he's a guy that held on to the promise. He held on to God. Uh, so the other good thing that I get to do today is I get to talk good about the Old Testament Saint Jacob. And if you were here at all for the series in Joseph, I bashed on old man Jacob a whole heck of a lot. And he deserved it. Amen? He deserved all of it, I would say. Um, but this is one of his moments that was just absolutely brilliant. It's this, this moment that we're about to read through. This is probably my favorite um, account in all of the New Testament. Um, it deeply inspires me. So let's go to Genesis chapter 32, verse 24. And let me give you the timing just really quick. Uh, this is, all happens before the life of Joseph events. He's a little kid when this takes place. Benjamin, the youngest uh, member of the family, is not yet born. This is in a place called Peniel. And Jacob is in, in this place called Peniel. All alone one night, he has sent all of his family and all of his herds across the river. And the implication is that he's wanted to come there to pray. He's going to spend all night in prayer. But look what happens, verse 24. This left Jacob all alone in the camp, and a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. And when the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. Then the man said, let me go, for the dawn is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What in the world is happening here? So first off, you've got a man who comes while he's in prayer at Peniel and comes and starts wrestling or fighting. Jacob, who is this man? This is Jesus. But doesn't call him Jesus. I know. We got lots of reasons from the text to know that this is Jesus. And even the book of Hosea talks about this and, and mentions that it's God. This is what the scholars call a Christophany. Say Christophany. Christophany. Thank you for trying at least. Christophany. It's a big word, right? Christophany just means that Jesus showed up before Bethlehem. Because God the Son, second member of the Trinity, is eternal. And he showed up in Bethlehem. He was incarnated into human form in Bethlehem. Some of you guys know that story. But he was here. And several times throughout the Old Testament, he showed up. And this is one of the moments where Jesus himself shows up. And he shows up and he has a fight. He fights Jacob. That's interesting. And they fight. We don't know what kind of fight. We don't know if it was wrestling. We don't know if it was street fighting. We don't know if it was brawling. We don't know if it was bloody. We don't know. But it was rough. And it was all night long. It must have been brutal and must have been exhausting. Think all night long for a second. Exhausting, yes? So they have this big fight. And, and, and it says, the text says that, that Jesus saw he wouldn't win. Does that mess with you? It should. Messed with me when I first read it. Jesus saw he wouldn't win. What in the world does that mean? To me, this is like when the dad gets down on the living room floor with his kids and he's wrestling them and he puts one hand behind his back. Does the dad still have the power of this hand? Of course. But if he just brought his full power to the toddlers, that wouldn't be much fun, would it? So he puts one hand behind his back. He chooses, makes a conscious choice to limit his power for the purpose of what he's doing. And so Jesus comes in and he limits his power for the purpose of what he's doing. And that's, that's how I see it. And it's not going to be a total knockout. But in the midst of the wrestling, somewhere in the night, when he realized it wasn't going to be a total knockout, 
because Jacob was holding on so tightly to him. He touches his hip and you're like, well, what does that mean? He touches his hip. Like did lightning bolt come out of it? You know, and all of a sudden, like it wrenched the hip out of its socket. Could have been, could have been, could have just been that Jesus was a great fighter. Amen. Could have been that he was a great fighter and maybe he had the surgical knowledge of the human body similar to what a chiropractor does and knows exactly how to touch you and pull your hip out of its socket. I don't know. We're left to our imaginations, but it happened. And what I sense there is Jesus saying, I know you're holding on and I want you to keep holding on, but I'm also just going to show you that I have ultimate power here. And not only did I take your hip out of its socket, but I could do a whole heck of a lot more, Jacob, any moment I wanted to. And so that's how that fight is going. And Jacob is just holding on for dear life and he won't let go. And he's like, let go of me. I won't let go. What, what does this remind you of? To me, this reminds me of like, have you ever seen, well, I mean, we've all seen Rocky, so we know boxing, right? And you know how one boxer in the midst of the fight starts to get exhausted and they know they're not going to win. And what do they start to do? They hug the other boxer. You ever seen him do that? It's like the goofiest thing you've ever seen in your life. And why are they hugging the other boxer? They're just trying to bring a stop to the fight. They're just trying to hold on. They're exhausted. Hugging the other boxer is not winning. Can I get an amen? That is that's not winning. But it's hanging in there. And this is what Jacob is doing. He's hanging in there with Jesus. Verse 27, what is your name? The man asked. He replied, Jacob, your name will no longer be Jacob, the man told him. From now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought God and with men and have won. Please tell me your name, Jacob said. Why do you want to know my name? The man replied. Then he blessed Jacob there. So Jacob tells him his name, but then Jacob says, well, what's your name? And he just moves on, doesn't give it to him. <laughs> I kind of like that. Um, some scholars think that's because Jesus in this moment knew that Jacob already sensed who he was. Or it may be that he was just not going to give him the divine name. Jesus wanted, or Jacob wanted a blessing. And Jesus instead gives him a name. And if you know the Bible, you know that when someone is given a new, na new name by God, what God's really doing is giving them a new identity. He's coming to them and saying, you were before this person and you are now this person. And he calls him Israel. Say Israel. 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 It calls him Israel. And here's what Israel means in the Hebrew. It's actually a, kind of a combination word. And it's, it's from Sarah and El. And Sarah means to fight or to wrestle or to strive, sometimes even to conquer. And El means God. And so people have come to understand this, this name as meaning one who wrestles with God. Well, that's appropriate. One who does not give up. But here's the other really kind of weird spin is the word could also mean just because of the mysteriousness of the Hebrew language, it could mean that God wrestles with him. He wrestles with God or God wrestles with him. You're like, which is it? I don't know. It's a, it's a mystery. But both work, don't they? And if you read the passage close, the passage says a man came and wrestled with him which might be important. Verse 30, Jacob named the place Peniel, which means face of God. For he said, I have seen God face to face, yet my life has been spared. The sun was rising as Jacob left Peniel and he was limping because of the injury to his hip. He came and had a fight with Jesus and Jesus came and had a fight with him and he left wounded and he left limping for the rest of his life. Some of you guys have had a walk with God. And every interaction that you've had with God has not necessarily gone the way that you wanted it to go. Can I get an amen? amen. They, it doesn't necessarily go the way that you want it to go. And sometimes you come out of that trial with God and you come out wounded and you carry those wounds for the rest of your life. And Jacob carried a wound for the rest of his life. And I don't think that that wound was a negative, although it probably hurt. That wound was a mark that he had had an experience with God himself. Not everybody gets a wound like that. And when you got a wound like that, it's weirdly precious. So he was named Israel. And I love that he's named Israel because we know how screwed up Jacob was. Right? Like from the whole last series, we just talk, kept talking about over and over and over again. So God, when he, God comes in and he names and he gives him a new identity, gives Jacob a new identity, he doesn't give him an identity that says, you're a morally pure guy. 
or you're super religious, or you've got a great family. God doesn't say any of that. He says, you're one who wrestles with God. He defines him according to his persistent not letting go of God. And sometimes that's all we've got. And I love that. And it's super, super important because it defines Jacob's life. Like this is what he's known for. But not only that, please take this in. This is huge. In your reading of the entire Bible, this is huge. When God goes to name the entire nation that is his chosen people, what does he call them? Israel. They are called Israel. And so when God comes to his chosen people and says, these are my people, he doesn't say, these are my morally perfect people. And you know they weren't. They've got everything together and they're super religious and on and on and on and it goes. He says, no, these are my people who wrestle with God and God wrestles with them. You're like, of all the weird names to call a group of people, of all the weird characteristics to bring out, this is the central thing. It's almost like the father going and saying, this is the thing that you do and please don't ever stop and I'm gonna love you for this. And then we're spiritual Israel. Did you know that? Galatians says that. It says they were God's chosen people in the physical realm, but everybody who has come to Christ and accepted the covenant of Jesus Christ, we are spiritual Israel. So you are Israel. Say, I am Israel. I am Israel. I am Israel. I am one who wrestles with God. Some of you need to be renamed. Some of you need to take that name, maybe for the first time. I am Israel. I am one who wrestles with God. Or maybe God wrestles with me. Yes? Or maybe God wrestles with me. I love that it's not prim and proper. It's messy and it's real. Okay, so he's renamed. All right, now I want to go to Hebrews 10 for a second. And here's why. I think that this idea of us striving with Jesus Wrestling with Jesus, even being conquered by Jesus is so huge. I think some of us have been through stuff and the stuff that we've been through and the wrestling that we've done with God, we've came out and we let him conquer us. And when he conquered us, we came out better. What in the world does that mean? You came out better. You came out better after being conquered by God. Does that resonate with anybody? You, you're, you're better after you've been conquered by God. Why? Because you thought you were so strong. You spent your life thinking you were strong, thinking you were smart, thinking you deserved things, thinking you had a direction, you knew what your purpose and your dreams were, and then God came and picked a fight with you, and he fought you, and he conquered you, and he put you in your place. Was this just me? And I came out conquered by God. And when I was conquered, I was weirdly able now to conquer. You can have no victory in this life unless you've been conquered by God. You cannot conquer anything else in this life unless you've been conquered by him. You have to lay it down. Unless a, unless a seed dies... It abideth alone. But if it dies, if it's buried into the ground and it goes through a death as a seed, it bringeth forth much fruit. This is the DNA of the whole human soul and this is the way the kingdom of God works. Yes? Yeah. Sounds weird on the surface. We, we have to let the parable come in and start to define the way God sees our life actually defined. See, you would have written a story and said, my story looked a certain way. God comes in and says, you actually walked into a clearing with Jesus and you had a fight and you lost. And in the losing, you won. You won relationship and you won an experience and you won a, a new way of life where you're no longer self-reliant. You start to rely on him. And that was the defining moment of your life. You got to have a fight with Jesus. So Hebrews 10 is going to say it like this. It's going to come at it a different way, slightly. Say it a slightly different way. Hebrews 10, 22 says, Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. 
For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm, for God has been trusted to keep his promise. So the author of Hebrews says, how do you approach God? And again, I know this feels like I'm going a different direction here, but just go with me. How do you approach God? Will you approach God coming boldly to the throne of God to pray And the reason you come boldly is because Jesus has cleansed you 100% and you totally, you're free in that. You don't sit there and and, and quietly condemn yourself and feel guilty and can I even come to God and ask for things and approach him? Of course you can, Jesus paid, amen? You can come. And he says, and when you come, what you're gonna do is you're gonna hold on to the promise. You're gonna hold tightly without wavering. What's he doing there? Hold tightly without wavering? He's alluding to Jacob. He's saying, hey, listen, all you little Hebrew boys and uh, girls, you know, you, you church kids who went to Sunday school learning about Jacob's fight with Jesus in the clearing all your life, just like he held on and didn't let go, I need you to hold on to the promises of God and not let go. Hold on to the promise of God. Which promise? What are we even talking about? This is where I need you to really listen up because this connects. The promises are where God deals with you. You're like, I thought the promises were things that you put on greeting cards and stuff. (laughs) And they are, and they're encouraging. And they're good, but the promises are also the place where God deals with us. Because most of the promises that God has given us are not the promises that they want, they're the promises that we need. And I know I stole that line from Batman, but it was good, so I used it. But for every promise that God gives you, there's a thousand other promises you would have rather had. For every trial that you've been in, There's an outcome you wanted. There was a way that you wanted it to go. And the way that God took you often was not the way you wanted it to go. And often when we come to the truth of the scripture, we try to twist the truth of the scripture because it's not the truth that we want it to be. We wanted our truth instead. And God says, no, the truth is the truth. But this is my truth. No, the truth is the truth. And the promises are the promise. And God is God. And we don't make him in our image. He is God. We embrace him for who he is. People do this in the scripture all the time. They'll they'll go to the Bible and they'll be like, well, there's this question that that I can't find a verse for, pastor. Go and find a verse for me. You know what pastors usually do? Pastors usually go try to find something that sort of sounds like that thing that you're asking. And a lot of times that's how we get to heresy. Is we end up going to the Bible and we ask the Bible to answer questions that the Bible didn't set out to answer. And sometimes God did that intentionally. It's just like us saying, what's your name? And he's like, eh. <laughs> what about tattoos? Uh, he just leaves it. There's a lot of things he just leaves and we wish he would, we wish he would have had a whole dissertation on that. The things that God chooses to address in the scripture tell us a lot about what's important. Let the scripture speak and answer the questions it's decided to answer. That's submission. That's us surrendering, right? Not demanding that the scripture must speak to this cultural issue because I thought of it. And we come into the clearing and we have a fight with Jesus and let Jesus, let Jesus win the fight. So the promises have that effect to us. So promises are great. There's some scholars think there's 7,000 promises in the scripture to us. 7,000. Now that's a lot, amen? (laughs) 7,000 is a lot. So we're gonna talk about all of them today. No, we're not. We're not gonna talk about all of them today. 7,000 promises. And and sometimes you might be tempted to go into the scripture again and look at certain promises that were made to somebody else and apply them to yourself. Be careful with that. Sometimes they don't apply to you. 7,000 promises that were written to all of mankind from God. 7,000 of them. That's a whole heck of a lot. And they're all treasure So I'm going to show you 10 of them today, 10 promises of God that we're going to hold on to and clamp on to 
for dear life, just like Jacob did. And as we do, they're going to change us. Max Lucado actually came up with this list of 10 big promises. I think it's a great list, and I think it gets the point across. So we're going to walk through some of these. The very first promise is that you're stamped with God's image. You're made in the image of God, the Imago Dei. This is in Genesis chapter 1. God comes and breathes the breath of life into man, and man became a living soul, not just a biological body. And our culture tells us we are just a biological body, and that's it. When the biological body stops being biological, we're done. Our essence is done. That's not true. You are a divine soul. You have the spark of God within you. He made you that way. Whether you like it or not, he made you that way. And when he made you that way, he breathed value and he breathed worth into you. And that value and worth matters to him. So I give you Genesis 9 verse 6 up there because this is where God is giving the covenant to Noah. And one of the things God says to Noah when he's giving him the covenant is he said, at any time that a human being hurts or kills another human being, there's got to be judgment for that. Because that's a big deal. They can't do that. And he says, because man's been made in the image of God. He means men and women. Because he's been made in the image of God. Man, woman, child, regardless of your education, where you're born, uh, race, creed, anything, you're made in the image of God. You have the divine spark in you. That's massive. That's where we begin. And it's such a big deal. God says, you cannot hurt each other. So when one dog gets in a fight with another dog and kills the dog, we do not call the dog a murderer. But if a man kills another man, we call them a murderer. What are we doing? We're communicating the just fury of God over that situation with our language and says, this is ultimately wrong. But you get underneath that ultimately wrong stuff, what you're doing is you're talking about the value of a human being. So when Cain goes and kills Abel, some of you guys know this story. Cain goes and kills Abel. I know I'm giving you a lot of stories today. Are you all right? Okay. Cain goes to kill Abel. You know what God says to him? He says his blood that had been spilled on the ground, he says it calls from the ground to me. Cain, what have you done? The blood calls from the ground to God. You know what God is saying? He's saying there is justice in this universe. And people can't kill each other. And when they do, there's vengeance that comes up in a just judge. You have to hear his rage there because it's important. We don't talk about this in church very much. I know. But this is, this is a very, very important side to things. There was a woman that came and visited me one time. And we had a conversation. And she let me know that she had been raped. And it's, it had been years ago. And she let me know that in the midst of all of that, there were questions about it and things like that. And, and because there were questions about it, many of her friends didn't believe her story. And many of her friends treated it like it was no big deal. And that had messed with her. So you've got the rape that messed with her, of course. The destruction of that. All the different layers to that. But then you've got the reaction of the friends who treated it like it was no big deal. And I don't know what messed with her more. Super tough. So we're sitting there talking, and we open up this passage. Say, no. You were treated like you were a piece of meat. You were treated like an object. You were treated like you're about. And that's wrong. Do you realize that screams out to God and God is enraged by this? Why is God enraged by this? Because divine justice must be. Because you are a valuable daughter of the king. You cannot be treated like this. And when you are, we should all be enraged over it. Because when we're not We speak a lie about value over that person. Am I making sense today? We speak a lie about value. We should all mourn with her 
We should all be angry over what was done to her. We should all give it the weight that the thing is due when we're in her circle of influence. Why? Because we have to correct the lie with the truth. We have to live the truth with her. And the truth is she's been stamped with the Imago Dei, the image of God inside of her, and she is worth something. No matter what our culture says, she is worth something. And she had to let, okay, now swing it back around to all the other stuff. She had to let a promise of God be her anchor in the most difficult situation in her life. And she walked into the clearing with Jesus and they had a fight. And she had things that she wanted and she had truths that she wished were true. And she had things that she might have wanted, dreams, things she wanted God to do. What Jesus gave her was a promise. And that's what she had to hold on to. And as she held on to the promise that God offered her, true healing could come because part of the entire painful process of healing, and I know there's way much more to it than this, but part of the painful process of healing is letting go of your self-reliance and letting the great healer, Jesus Christ, heal you his way. The promises of God. The next one is that you are an heir of God. This one's not going to be so serious. You okay for some not so serious? Yeah. Ever see the movie Annie or the musical Annie? What kind of life does she live? A hard knock life. Yes? You're hearing the song right now, right? I'm not going to sing it. It's a hard knock life. What's a hard knock life? Hard knock life is they're poor. She doesn't have the resources that she needs. She's got somebody taking care of her that's super selfish and cruel to her. Yes? And there's no hope. She's going to be stuck in this spot for the rest of her life. So she's in a hard knock life. And what's going to change the hard knock life? Daddy Warbucks is. Because he's going to come in and he's not just going to give her a few bucks. He's going to adopt her. And it is the adoption that instantly, overnight, changes everything. Right? Because once she's been adopted and brought into his home, all of a sudden she has resources. All of a sudden she's going to be treated with love and respect. And all of a sudden she's got hope. Why? Because she's been adopted. You're an heir of God does not just mean that you are blessed. It means that as a child of God, you inherit the rights and all the blessings of a child of God. And some of you have had a hard knock life. And some of you are in it now. And you're like, I can't wait for this life to be over because it's been terminal pain and it's been cancer and it's been a broken family and it's been a broken marriage and it's been all the broken things. And this life did not go the way that I wanted it to go. And Disney told me all my dreams would come true and Disney lied. <laughs> but you were an heir and someday... Everything here will feel like it had been a bad dream because the sun will outshine everything in your imagination and God will wipe every tear from your eye. And there will be no more tears and there will be no more crying and there will be no more pain for the former things have passed away. And you will walk streets of gold and you will see Jesus face to face and everything will be changed in an instant because you are an heir of God and it means so much more than just blessing. And for some of you, that's the promise that you need to hold on to. And you're like, but I wish it was now. And I get that. But go into the clearing with Jesus. And bring him everything that you wished you could have had. And let him correct you. And let him drive you away from your self-reliance. And say, but this is the anchor I want you to hold on to. Do you see how the promises work? This is how it works in the Christian life. We hold on to what God tells us to hold on to. The tomb is temporary. I love this one. The tomb is temporary. So you've been at deathbeds and you've been through funerals and you've been at the cemetery. You know what, you know what pastors think when we go to a cemetery with people? Because we're at cemeteries a lot. Can I just tell you that? It's a big part of the gig of being a pastor. You're at a cemetery with people and you know that they're going to walk in there and they're going to be surrounded by death 
and all the tombstones and everything, and everything is screaming at them, death and end and finality. And you want to show them the promises of God. You want to read to them scripture that talks about the fact that this all gets swallowed up. And let's trust that. Let's trust what God's told us. I had a great Aunt Jo. I say had a great Aunt Jo. She's still alive. I'm sorry I use that language. If you're watching Aunt Jo, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have a great Aunt Jo. Aunt Jo is 96 years old, and she is the honoriest Christian lady you've ever met in your life. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. And uh, so one of the recurring jokes she would always say whenever we were at a cemetery, she's like, she's like, whenever the second coming comes and the rapture comes, she's like, I just want, I just want a lawn chair to sit down in the middle of the cemetery and I want to watch the dirt fly. <laughs> it's so great. And some of you hear that and you're like, I don't know that we should joke about death. Yes, we should. Because death is a defeated foe. And we should mock it much more often than we do. And we join in the heart of this world that believes that death is our end and we dread it and it's the secret fear of every Christian. And we've got to be honest with that fear and we've got to let the truth of God replace that fear. The tomb is temporary. We will be reunited. I'm giving you 1 Thessalonians 4 because that's when Jesus comes. Right, And the Son of Man will come in the clouds with the voice of the archangel. And the dead in Christ will what? They will rise first. The dirt will fly. Amen? Amen. The dirt will fly. And those who are still alive will be caught up with them in the clouds. And, and so we will be with them and with the Lord Jesus forever and encourage one another with these words. You're going to see them. If they are in Christ, you are going to see them. And you will suddenly discover that the tomb was temporary all along and that you had believed the lie. And not only will you cry as you hug them, but maybe, just maybe, some of you will laugh just a little bit that you ever believed the lie. Because here will be the reality right in front of you. And got to hold on to the anchor today. And take what God has given you. Next is you are key to his kingdom and you are key in his kingdom. So, so follow me on this one. So God planned every single one of your days, it says in the book of Psalms, and wrote them down in his book before one of them came to be. Every single one of your days was planned. That's a big deal. And then it says later that all the works that you were supposed to do in the kingdom of God, they were prepared in advance for you to do by God. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like purpose. I, you've got a purpose. God knows exactly how many days you're going to live and exactly what you're supposed to accomplish before you die. You have great purpose today. And then you go on in the scripture and it starts talking about the way the kingdom works and how some of us are like eyeballs and some of us are like ears and some of us are like noses. You're like, well, I don't want to be the nose. Me either. But we've all got a different part to play. And that's what it's trying to say is like you play a part. And it says that the kingdom of God can't do without you. We need you. So I'm talking to a, a lady one day and she's a little bit older and we're having this discussion and I'm just getting to know her and stuff. And she says, yeah, she's like, I used to serve in this way. I used to do this and it gave me a lot of joy. And, but now I don't. And, Wait a second, why, why don't you serve now? Well, you know, some things happened and some people said some things and I got older and I didn't know if they wanted to use older people. And she's like, I just kind of thought maybe God was putting me on a shelf. Maybe he just wanted to put me on a shelf. Is that what that says? No. Heck no. Raise your hand if you're breathing oxygen today. Anyway. Oh, you're slow second service, man. <laughs> <laughs> if you're breathing oxygen, you're key in the kingdom of God. And if you've got days to live, you've got days to serve. And those have been mapped out for you and he's got work to be done for you. Don't warm a chair. Your church attendance is not your Christian life. You're key in the kingdom. That's a promise for you. That matters. Next, justice will prevail. Every place that justice exists in our world, it weighs down on us. 
Every time that we see a cruelty, every, every time we see that things did not go right, we long for the day that all things will go right. Can I get an amen? amen? We long for the day when everything will be corrected, everything will come into the light, and finally, justice will roll on like a river. We long for that. So back when the George Floyd killing happened, and I, I remember talking to some of my friends, and, and, and there was this, this one lady I, I, I got to know, and I was talking to her, and she's black, and she tells me part of her experience, part of the things that she was experiencing at the time, she would go into like a, a, a store, like, like a Walmart, and, and people would follow her around because she was black. They'd follow her around to make sure that she wasn't going to shoplift. It's kind of like, what is this? And people might have opinions about that. You're welcome to them. The point is, someday your opinions won't matter because everything will be brought to light. And justice will actually be done by the person who knows. And my sister invites white friends to go to her to go shopping so she doesn't get followed around in Walmart. You think she looks forward to the day that justice will finally be done? I think she does. Revelation 20, then I saw a great white throne and God was on it. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and the books were finally opened. And the dead were judged according to what they had done. And Jesus said in Luke 8, for all that is secret will eventually be brought into the open and everything that is concealed will be brought to light and made known to all. It seems like we've got an abundance of opinions and theories, perspectives and platforms. We're swamped in it. Someday I want all the truth. And I want all the truth to be done. And God will do it. And that's an anchor to hold on to. I don't know who you are, but you needed that anchor today. The next, next slide is five more promises. And I'm not going to go through them. Because we don't have time. Whew, but they're so good. Do you see how tempted I am? I'm so tempted. Your prayers have power. The devil's days are numbered. It's on a calendar. Did you know that? When the devil's over. There is no condemnation if you're a believer. Joy is soon coming. Your pain, your struggle may last for the night, but joy comes in the morning. Maybe that's your promise today. And God gets you. You're like, I have this struggle. I have this in my past and nobody understands me. And they've all got advice for me. But nobody gets me. Do you know Jesus gets you? That's an amazing promise for us. So much to that. I'd say pick your promise. What's yours? What do you need to hold on to? Right now. You ever seen a parent throw their toddler up in the air? It looks not so safe when you see it, right? But when mom or dad is throwing the toddler up in the air and catching them over and over and over again, what's the toddler doing? Laughing. Like belly laughing. Having a great time. You know what the toddler's not doing? The toddler's not thinking about the science of all this. And it's better for it. Right? Sometimes... Sometimes we forget that. We forget that picture because where does the laugh come from? Well, you got to back it up, right? Like that toddler has absolute, complete trust without question in their mom or dad. Yes? And because of that absolute, complete trust, it feels total freedom to not worry about where am I going to land? It doesn't. Total freedom. And what does the total freedom lead to? Total joy. Belly laugh. And a lot of us start with the belly laugh when we're first Christians. And then we get so much smarter. And then we try to start figuring our own life out again. And then we read some more verses and we think that we know. And we start telling God what we think he ought to do. And we start getting mad at God when he doesn't do what we think he ought to do. And we do all the things, don't we? We do all the things. We're just like Jacob. We do all the things. We get totally self-reliant. We don't even know what's happening. It's like this very, very slow hardening of the Christian. 
And then suddenly you walk into a clearing and Jesus is there to fight you. And he's there to dress you down. And you need it. So do I. And he wants to, he wants to give you some things to hold on to that are real. Because he's got good for you. Not bad. But you do have to get conquered. And Jesus said, said unless you change and become like a, one of these little children, you can't enter the kingdom of God. You got to get your laugh back. Yeah? Why don't you guys stand? What's your promise today? What's God going to use in your life to reignite your joy? Reignite your trust. Reignite your freedom. What's he going to do in your life? Those promises are gold. They're treasure. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you, God, for the truth of your word. Show us how to walk out this Christian life, Lord, even when it gets messy. Help us, Lord, in the, in the midst of all the things that we're going through right now. God, and you see us all individually. You know right where we're at. God, would you give us our anchor to hold on to? The truth is they're all you. Hmm. Show us a new way, Lord. We love you. In Christ's name, amen.